most recent article, This Marvelous Bean, published in French Historical Studies 2015, examines the question of how the French adopted Arab Ottoman coffee and reimagined it as her own national drink over the course of the 18th century. She is currently writing a book about the history of coffee in France to be called Embracing the Queen of Beans, How Coffee Was Adapted adopted into French medicine, fashion, and diet, 1660 to 1789. Her paper today is entitled Caribbean Coffee, French Culture, Circulating Knowledge Between Colony and Metropole, 1715 to 1789. Thank you, Cynthia. I'll just say to start that when I lived, um, the year I was doing my research in Paris, I lived on Rue Le Pic in Montmartre, and around the corner from me, there was a store that was called the Colonial Goods Store. <laughs> <laughs> like everything you're talking about. It was very funny. All right, thank you for being here, everyone. Sidney Mintz fam famously argues in his History of Sugar that the seemingly trivial and non-historical taste for sweetness played a significant role in pushing such major socioeconomic developments as the rise of capitalist merchant empires, the emergence of Caribbean plantation economies, and the Industrial Revolution. I see the desire for caffeinated stimulants, specifically coffee, possessing similar propulsive powers. Sugar commodification and cultivation long preceded coffee, but in many ways established the conditions for coffee to thrive under European control. Both commodities originally came to Europeans' attention from Muslim countries in West Asia. Both required a sophisticated command of organized labor and machinery to be processed and brought to market in commercial quantities. And both boomed in production once Europeans brought the plants to their new tropical, co tropical colonies and addressed the problem of profitability by using enslaved labor. Could you? And I should warn you, there's going to be a lot of slides. Okay. <laughs> a fashionable family, such as shown here, consuming coffee in late 18th century France, like Elizabeth was describing, was enjoying the end result of a very complex and morally dubious production history. If oriented toward Enlightenment theories about bodily health and food preparation, as many educated households were, this family would likely be familiar with current views on the benefits and risks of drinking coffee. But unless the master or mistress kept up on the latest publications about the colonies, they probably knew at most only half the story about the forces and tensions that produced their morning brew. For centuries, coffee was grown commercially only in Yemen, shown here in southern Arabia, and distributed exclusively via the great port of Mocha, which I've circled in red there. Coffee beans reached Europe circa 1615 and France around 1650. Following an uncertain beginning characterized by curiosity, doubt, and medical disputes over coffee, coffee safety, by 1700, imported coffee had been enthusiastically adopted in France. Because Yemeni limits on production kept coffee prices extraordinarily high, European entrepreneurs began to think they might profit if they could break Yemen's monopoly by establishing coffee plantations in various colonies. And in the, so this map I found recently, and I doctored it a little bit to uh, it went up to the 20th century, and I, I pushed the coloration back to the 18th century, so you can sort of keep track a little bit of some of what I'll talk about. In the Caribbean, this idea turned coffee into one of the leading commodities produced in the French settlements, second only to sugar and profitability and a novel impact on the European diet, excuse me, on the French diet. Through the 18th century, the French sought to strategically position themselves in a rapidly shifting contest to dominate the global production and trade in coffee. The Dutch got an earlier start at Java in the 1690s and Suriname in uh, South America in the 1710s. The English quickly followed the French in Jamaica during the 1730s, but French colonies ultimately dominated the 18th century co global coffee market, with Saint-Domingue alone producing over 60% of the world's beans by 1780. This paper today examines multiple forms of knowledge about coffee that flowed between the French metropole and its Caribbean colonies. Traditionally, early scientific coffee expertise has been described as coming chiefly from the center. The crown charged physicians, theologians, pharmacists, pharmacists, and botanists with assessing whether coffee was beneficial or dangerous for consumers. In response, those experts produced a small library's worth of literature on the medical, chemical, and botanical nature of coffee, concluding, with some caveats, that it was a wonder drug. After coffee cultivation took off in the French West Indies, the colonies quickly also became sites of significant experimentation and knowledge production on the subject of coffee. 
However, in these places, it fell under the scrutiny of a very different interest, oriented not to consumer safety, but to uh, commercial profit. From the start, center and periphery vied for primacy in uh, claiming expertise over coffee cultivation among the French. The Jardin du Roi in Paris should have been a power nexus for developing knowledge about plants with as much commercial potential as coffee. Yet its professor of botany, Antoine de Jussieu, struggled to obtain uh, information about coffee cultivation in Arabia and to acquire live clippings and viable seeds. After several attempts at sprouting seeds and transplanting living branches failed, he received a full-grown coffee plant from the Burgomaster of Amsterdam. This new tree soon matured to flower and fruit on French soil, which feat de Jussieu reported very proudly to the Acad uh, Académie Royale des Sciences in 1716. That same year, Jean de la Roque published the travel account of a group of merchants from the Compagnie des Indes Orientales, who had recently gained a monopoly over all imports of mocha coffee to France, and between 1708 and 1713, became the first Frenchman to visit Yemen and see actual coffee plantations. This immediately became useful information when, in 1710, a variant species of coffee was discovering growing on the Ile de Bourbon, a colony that the Compagnie des Indes Orientales very conveniently controlled. Along with descriptions of how to cultivate coffee, both de Jussieu and La Roque, shown on the left and the right there, uh, published botanical illustrations from life, as they said, as prior to this period, first-hand knowledge of the plant that produced the bean was non-existent in France. All right, back to our distribution map now. But you notice there's a red arrow that I've added. This map doesn't tell the full story. Encouraged by de Jussieu's proof that coffee could be cultivated outside Yemen, but perhaps also by La Roque's account of plantations in Yemen, not to mention the reports of coffee growing wild and practically begging for cultivation on the Ile de Bourbon, in 1716 the Jardin du Roi and the Académie Royale des Sciences arranged to send some of the plants that were raised in Paris to Martinique. Unfortunately, Isambert, the botanist tapped to deliver them, died of yellow fever one week after landing ashore, and the, product, uh, the project died with him. Now we have, it's hard to see, I didn't anticipate such a large audience, uh, or such a large room, I should say, but there are little red, air, little red circles and also some blue circles. Uh, in 1719, the governors of Martinique and French Guiana that are circled in red separately decided to try cultivating coffee again. They each wrote to the Royal Marine Council seeking permission to acquire plants from, and this is circled in blue, uh, respectively, Yemen and Suriname. And we don't know why they didn't uh, ask for plants from Paris. In any case, their polite requests failed. The Compagnie des Andes Orientales had no intention of losing what was by now a monopoly on all coffee imports to France, both from Yemen and from the Ile de Bourbon, and the Dutch in Suriname had become fiercely protectionist about their coffee. There's a little teeny arrow now going from Suriname, Dutch Suriname, to French Guiana. The king's lieutenant in Guiana, Francois de la Motte Aigrand, managed to liberate, liberate some seeds from neighboring Suriname. Anyway, he commissioned someone to steal them. Another picture now. Uh, here's a close-up of a map that shows La Motte Aigrand's uh, personal plantations. By 1721, he managed to grow some trees from these seeds, and he produced enough new seeds to share with his fellow colonists both locally and in Martinique and Guadeloupe. Despite this success and the lack of assistance from France, he requested a trained botanist from France to continue the project. And this is now the full map, and the other red circles show all the other plantations that sprouted from those seeds that he grew. Whether La Motte et Grande's gift represents the beginnings of coffee in the Antilles is unclear. Rivaling this very sensible, you might say boring, history of intracolony seed sharing is a very different origin story that has been repeated so often it has passed into legend and can be found in various forms all over the internet today. So if you Google coffee Martinique history, you get this. In 1721, Gabriel de Clio, a French Navy lieutenant, supposedly risked everything to rescue his fellow Martinique colonists from a recent cacao blight by bringing them a coffee seedling from the Jardin des Plantes in Paris. Some say he had to steal the plant. 
All accounts say that he protected it from his shipmates' cruelty and gave it his own rations during water rations during a dangerous passage to help it survive the Atlantic crossing. A 1774 poem written on the occasion of his death gives a sense of the sentiments he inspired. And I translated it to English and I kept the rhymes because I thought it was so cute. This hero citizen in the springtime of his years, on a frail vessel racked by tempest fierce, dared, braving wind and waves aslant, to give the new world a beloved plant, which revives our bodies exhausted by cares, which gives to our blood new health, and, shades of Elizabeth's project, circulates in our homeland new wealth. And the little asterisk coffee is in the original. It's like, just in case you didn't know what plant it was that he brought. Cleo himself went to great lengths to ensure his own legacy. Twice he persuaded governors to insert attestations about his deed into their reports to the Marine Council. And the, these letters start to say like, as everybody knows, Cleo wants you to know. Um, and near the end of his own life, he published a letter in the Année Littéraire claiming that the success of French Caribbean cult coffee culture owed everything to him. But against this legend, there are several contemporary accounts that claim coffee was already growing on Martinique when Clio brought his plant over. Well, who knows? Even if Clio was not the heroic savior that he imagined, his story illustrates the lack of easy communication between metropole and colony. Despite so many parties invested in coffee cultivation on both sides of the Atlantic, actually getting viable seeds and cuttings into the hands of people able to raise them to maturity was no easy task. Coffee reached Saint-Domingue about a decade later than Martinique as a random gift sent by the Jesuits of Martinique to their brothers. Colonists there took to it with alacrity. A mere five or six years later, the minimum time for seedlings to mature into fruiting trees, Saint-Domingue officials recorded their first commercial crop and set Saint-Domingue on the path to becoming the leader among all French colonies growing coffee for the world market. By 1753, nearly 13 million coffee trees were counted on the French side of the island. And after the peace of 1763, that number grew dramatically until there were over 3,500 coffee plantations spread across this tiny colony with an output rivaling sugar in value. Similar leaps in production took place all over the French Caribbean, with censuses recording expanding pr coffee production between the 1730s and 50s on uh, Guyane, Guadeloupe, um, next one, there's Guadeloupe, um, uh, Marie Galante, Saint Vincent, uh, Martinique, uh, let's see, I've lost track. Um, oh, and then we've got, we've got Guadeloupe, Martinique, and uh, Saint Domingue, of course, and not to mention Grenada, Dominique, Saint Lucie, coffees everywhere. As the opportunity for profits beckoned, visiting naturalists, scientifically minded agronomists, and local planters oriented to practical questions of survival and profit all began to publish their observations about coffee. Some focused on its botany, others wrote manuals for cultivating it, still others wrote diatribes against or praise toward its cultivators. Before any colonist had staked out a public position of experiential authority on coffee, the field still appeared open to visitors from France. In 1724, the naturalist Jean-Louis Milot arrived in Guyane. After thoroughly exploring the colony, he returned to France and wrote up his observations for use in a travelogue published by Père Labat in 1730. But some years later, convinced that French coffee production was headed for long-term failure, Milo published a freestanding pamphlet on the subject under his own name. He believed the colonists' growing methods were resulting in inferior beans that lacked character. To remedy this, Milo pub uh, proposed, quote, five principal maxims which were absolutely necessary for preserving coffee's spiritual and odiferous qualities, end quote. He claimed that if they were er observed exactly, quote, the, colony, the coffee of our colonies would equal or even surpass the price of that coming from Mocha. To elevate his own authority, Milo sourced his agricultural knowledge to an Arab he met in England, who he said had learned it in Yemen. Despite such provenance, he presumed colonists would resist his advice because, quote, even the best arguments hold no power with people who only think about their needs of the moment, end quote. Milo was neither colonist nor planter. His desire to elevate the prices commanded by Caribbean beans suggests a colonial perspective, but he was also critical of the planter class for prioritizing production speed over flavor and quality. Um, his work was uh, very much a work by an outsider. It was written for a metropolitan French audience. 
The first coffee planters in the Caribbean made production look so simple that many poorer free inhabitants lacking resources, whether of money or land or labor, saw in coffee the perfect get-rich-quick scheme. In the mid-1740s, Elie Monero, witness to early successes on Saint-Domingue and the failures that followed, began circulating a manuscript manual on coffee cultivation. This was the first to be written by a colonist, not a visitor from France. He focused on two misconceptions, that coffee was easy to grow and that it was even easier to profit from. To stress his primary message, the planters must not be seduced into thinking coffee plantations required neither effort nor manpower. And I quote, coffee culture seems golden at first. The ease with which it is cultivated is completely charming and you will be enchanted with your progress. The few workers needed to plant vast numbers of trees will have you dreaming about how the best revenue comes from that which costs the least and produces the most. And this made me think of Donald Trump when I read it last year. <laughs> but he continues, this fantasy vanishes at harvest time. Now think about elections coming up, right? Only then will you realize your folly and, rec re and recognize your folly and realize that those handsome coffee trees that promise so much, in fact, ru threaten ruin from their first appearance. So now you know how to vote. Monero knew from experience that planters were interested in profit above all else. Admitting, quote, I wasn't always exempt from these mistakes myself, end quote, he focused his text on what not to do as much as what to do in order to cultivate coffee successfully. For example, he pointed out that while it was possible to plant a great number of trees with only a few slaves to help, those same trees would require six to ten times the number of workers to pick and process the beans. Unless one could afford <coughs> to purchase or borrow sufficient slave labor, one's investment would be entirely lost. During the next 30 years, coffee production on Saint-Domingue exploded, forming a period historians have dubbed the Coffee Revolution. Some, notably Michel René Iliard d'Aubertuy, whose work is here, came to regard coffee planters with extreme distaste for, as he saw it, their willingness to experiment with increasingly marginal lands and to work slaves to death in the never-ending quest for profit. Calling coffee a destructive culture, he complained, quote, coffee attracts those Europeans who will always be strangers in the colony, men who are too easily dazzled by prodigious crops that once sold at excessive prices. Since the peace of 1763, they have employed over 40,000 Negroes and killed the greater part of them. They didn't foresee that this luxury food, becoming better known and multiplying, would fall into disrepute and become worthless." End quote. In Iliard d'Aubertuy's perspective, the very nature of the coffee tree, which typically lived only 20 years, precluded any interest among its planters in making long-term investment in land management or slaves. Worse, just when coffee planters were clearing the remaining wild lands, its price was undercut by competition from Dutch Suriname. For this reason, he lamented, O oh, coffee, deadly gift of Arabia, how will you compensate the colonists for all that you have stolen from them? Now, Hilliard d'Aubertuy may have had a point, insofar as in France many in the coffee business uh, maintained a bias against coffee from the colonies. It was cheaper than mocha, but that was virtually all that could be said for it. Some retailers lumped all col colonial coffee together as Café des Îles, as in this advertisement here. Others identified it generically as Martinique coffee. A very few acknowledged that Bourbon, Caribbean, and Guyanese coffee beans had distinctly different appearances and qualities, which a gourmet might find interesting. Leading mid-century cookbook authors disdained the American product altogether, recommending mocha as the sole source of beans, seconded, excuse me, seconded by Voltaire, who in Candide in, in 1759 bluntly called American coffee bad. Let us close this survey of old regime knowledge production about coffee cultivation with um, Louis Elie uh, Moreau de Saint-Marie, who based his thorough description de la partie française de l'île Saint-Domingue on the island as it was in 1789, on the cusp of revolution. Disagreeing with Iliard d'Aubertuy, Saint-Marie regarded the colony's coffee production as a crucial centerpiece of its economy. He detailed every parish's plantations, pausing to address questions of soil quality and suitability of situation for coffee in every case. For the major coffee-growing parishes, such as Dondon in the north, 
he provided an even more granular breakdown of different sizes of coffee estates, which he catalogued according to how many pounds of coffee each produced per year and at what value. Where he thought coffee planters deserved criticism, he gave it freely, but where they were successful, he offered fulsome praise. In the 40-odd years since Milo had worried publicly that colonists cared nothing about the quality of beans they were producing, attitudes had clearly changed. Saint-Marie pointedly identified specific coffees of Saint-Domingue as being respectively, and I quote, superior to all the rest in the region, or, quote, a bean regarded as the best in all the Antilles, or, most impressively of all, quote, indistinguishable from coffee from the Levant. Of this last, he managed to simultaneously praise its flavor and challenge the expertise of those who claimed to prefer coffee from mocha over colonial products, as he remarked proudly, quote, these beans fool the eye of the connoisseur and the palate of the gourmet. To conclude now, initially, governors in the West Indies clearly wanted the metropolitan government to supply colonists with the means to start coffee cultivation by sending both seeds and botanists. But the crown, hampered by the mercantilist demands of its own East India Company, could not be relied upon to do so. Colonists had to take matters into their own hands and acquire seeds, clippings, and agricultural expertise in any way possible. This they did, in the process shifting the locus of knowledge on coffee from the home country to the West Indies. By 1789, the French Caribbean was the global leader in coffee production and Saint-Domingue in particular had become the most valuable colony in the world, famously thanks to sugar, but also significantly because of coffee. Thank you.